Okay, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Today's subject matter is separation anxiety relapse from COVID-19, prevention, intervention, and treatment. Our presenter today is Dr. Sally Foote. Dr. Foote is a veterinary behavior consultant, writer, and speaker. She has presented at national conferences, including ABMA, VMX, and the Midwest Veterinary Conference. She is a guest lecturer at many of the veterinary colleges in the United States with 30 years of general practice with behavior niche experience. Dr. Foote now focuses her time speaking and creating online education, building the discipline of low stress animal care. Dr. Foote received her DVM in 1984 from the University of Illinois College of Veterinary Medicine. She is a certified animal behavior consultant by the International Association of Animal Behavior Consultants, Low Stress Handling Certified, Silver, and Fear Free Elite Certified. Dr. Foote has several uh, has served on several uh, committees. Sorry about that. The yeah. Illinois State Veterinary Medical Association and is past president of the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior. We welcome Dr. Foote. Thank you. Well, I'm so happy to be here this afternoon or noon <laughs> to uh, go through this presentation. And so I'm going to go ahead and get started and um, try to pace it so that we have some time for questions at the end. So that's myself with my pet dog, Bella. If you go on my YouTube channel, you will see her featured in a lot of the videos. So our first uh, learning objective, the things I'm gonna to cover today is first of all, understanding that separation anxiety is actually a spectrum of anxiety behaviors, oftentimes with some in other comorbidities of anxiety, meaning you, this, this dog or cat, in this case, we're gonna focus on the dog, uh, not only has separation anxiety, but may also have noise phobia or you know, fear of strangers. Uh, the second thing is I want you to, I mean, we're going to go a little bit over the choices of medications, supplement, therapeutic devices, and alternative therapies, all of which may be a part of a treatment plan. Third, to realize that separation anxiety is the most common behavior problem of rescue dogs. We have a lot of rescue dogs out there who have separation anxiety, and it may not be evident in the shelter, and people may not have told the owner. So if people have just adopted, and I did a recent webinar uh, with a shelter care veterinary professional on how so many of these dogs are now in foster homes, we may, be, we may see this pop up when we all go back to work or you know our states start to open up. Oh, cool. Lastly, the steps to prevent separation anxiety relapse or developing separation anxiety during our stay at home orders. So I like to think of, instead of using the term separation anxiety, I like to think about anxiety about separation. And the reason why is, I guess for me, I just would get this you know, mental image of the dog who has already ripped the siding off of, you know, the trim off of the doors, there's a hole in the wall, you know, they've already destroyed the home. And yes, that, those are the signs we will see with a very high level of separation anxiety, yet separation anxiety will ha have other, anxiety, other presentations. So anxiety signs can range from mild to panic. So this is what I was talking about before. It's like a spectrum, a, spectral, a spectrum from mild to severe and panic being severe. And this is, happens when the animal is removed from a bonded environment or companion. So it can happen with the dog changing homes. That's how that can happen. You may see separation anxiety. So maybe about bonding to the environment or a companion. And that companion can be human or another pet. Really all species can show this behavior problem. It is not unique to dogs. We're, like I said, we're focusing on the dog here. So dogs tend to pace, whine. Uh, some of the signs you might see are pacing, whining, they may be digging in a new type of crate in the home, but they were fine in the old crate. So that's uh, some of the signs you see. We may see in a cat that the cat starts to vomit when the owner leaves for a weekend trip. Or of course, we have also seen some of those you know, inappropriate elimination problems in the cat. And the, and the third example here is just giving you another species of the horse. A horse that's whinnying and calling to the other horse when its companion horse is let out of the paddock for care, that is actually separation anxiety in the horse. It may be at a very low level, but I want you to, I want you to start thinking, you know, broadly in this way about separation anxiety. 
Well, let, we're focusing on the dog, so let's talk about the body language and the signs of anxiety. There are three forms of separation anxiety. And um, this handout here, this document here, this is uh, Dr. Sophia Yin at, uh, had created this, has created this uh, handout, and it is still available for download at the website, drsophiayin.com shop. This is the body language of fear in dogs. This is those early signs of fear and anxiety that let us know that the dog is feeling upset. So they, we want to recognize this before they reach panic. All right, let's talk about the three forms. So we have the mild to moderate signs of anxiety. And I, I kind of, this is my term to call it the pack rat dog. It's kind of innate. Uh, this you may start to see at, in a dog around six months of age and there's been no you know, inciting um, fearful incident, but this is the dog who kind of keeps picking up the socks and they pick up the underwear or they pick up the pen or they pick up the remote control, you know, things that the owner has handled and it has owner scent on them and they're not destroying them. They're not chewing them up. It isn't, they're not parading it around the house for attention. It's they gather them up and usually put them in their bed and they lay with them. And it typically happens when the owner is gone. Now, there's not a whole lot, there's, there isn't property destruction, you know, there isn't, the animal is not in a very high state of alarm, they're able to eat, they're able to drink, they're able to go outside, and you know, frankly, some clients think this is kind of cute. Yet, this is that very first level, the mild to moderate level of anxiety, because what they're doing is they're collecting up these items for self-soothing. And the second level, this is called acquired. This is where uh, actually it usually starts with this kind of innate, this pack rat dog, who now becomes more anxious as they are seeing their companion or their, say their owner leaving. And now the dog will start to go into more pacing, whining, or digging, especially digging at uh, doorways, digging at windows, digging at places to leave or try to escape. And typically, and so these signs of digging and the pacing and the whining may be moderate to severe. So severe being a puddle, a huge puddle of uh, saliva on the floor from the drooling and the whining, et cetera. And they, this typically, you'll see this kind of level start up within 20 minutes of the separation when the, when the owner leaves, when the other companion dog leaves, or now when this dog has been put in a different environment. And that, so usually within 20 minutes of that separation, from the bonded environment or person. And it tends to, you know, they work up and then they cycle every 20 minutes typically. Now the acute, this is the third form, what you may, you may be hearing your clients tell you about. And I live in Illinois. And right now we are in thunderstorm slash tornado season. And just two days ago, well, yeah, Monday night, <laughs> we lost all our power for five hours because all of a sudden a thunderstorm came through with 50 mile an hour winds and it took down a bunch of trees and I think lightning zapped the transformer in our area and we didn't have any internet until yesterday at 1 p.m. Welcome to the tornado belt. So for some of our dogs, we now may have a client calling or finding out that now this dog is suddenly, he's never shown the pacing or whining before, but now when you leave, this dog suddenly starts pacing, whining, or digging at the windows and really trying to escape. In other words, they go to a high panic, escaping out of the crate. And oftentimes, this happened right after a severe event, some things like a tornado, a hailstorm event. I've also had uh, histories and cases where this happened when there was a robbery in the home. You know, somebody broke into the home. And they, uh, the dog may have been in the crate, the dog may have been loose, and they beat up, frankly, on the dog. And it was all really scary for the dog, and the owners were not home. So the dog is generalizing then the leaving of the owner to that fear, the memory of that traumatic event. Um, so those are the three different types of separation anxiety. So again, going a little bit more detailed, this is what I call the pack rat, okay? The cute little dog, he's got the sock in his mouth. And and it's that sock, that you know, underwear, the keys, it's called the transitional item, high risk for becoming the acquired uh, separation anxiety. Of course, this is also a high risk for getting a foreign body obstruction because chewing can be pacifying to the dogs. So if we you know, either ask our clients or our clients mention like, yeah, my dog likes to just gather up all my underwear and you know, put it in his bed, oh, it's so cute. Think, um, no. We got a problem brewing here. So to start to give some advice on um, what will go on a little bit later is very important.
uh, the acquired moderate to severe. So the high panic um, behaviors, what are you gonna see when, we're, when I'm calling this high panic? Self injury. Think about this. If you have a dog who has broken his tooth because he's trying to chew his way out of a crate, that dog was working so hard to get out of the crate. The dog was willing to suffer the pain of a broken canine tooth or the bro broken molar, you know, the broken and worn down incisors. That's significant. If their nails are being, have dug themselves, they've dug them to a bloody nails, that is painful. And it's actually because of that high state of panic that they're like not really feeling the pain. So that is significant. This animal is, is suffering, they're having a problem. Even if a client does not seem to think it's that big of a deal, it is a big deal. And of course, thirdly, I have seen dogs who go into bloat because of the excessive panting and the high anxiety because it alters the GI motility. Of course, they're inhaling a lot of air. The escape behaviors, okay, digging, chewing, ramming their head through a drywall wall. Yes, I've seen a video of a Rottweiler doing that. These are all behaviors that the dog is trying to get out of there. They're trying to escape. And they're willing to put enough effort to destroy that because frankly, once they've say, you know, chewed hard enough on the doorknob that it pops open, then they've learned to do that to get out. To, this is how they escape. Uh, there's activation of the sympathetic nervous system. This is why we see drooling, we see the barking, we see the whining, we see the pacing. Their, their muscles in their body are being activated to try to move, to try to get out. We see the urination. There's more stimulation to the bladder muscle such that they eliminate, they'll urinate. Uh, we may see defecation because there's more stimulation to that GI muscle and so they will pass a bowel movement if there's stool there. We may also see vomiting for the same reason. reason excuse me. Uh, that seeking and it, it blends with those escape behaviors. So the dog who keeps pacing to the windows, to the door, they go to the window and they're looking out, they're looking out because they're looking for the owner or looking for their companion dog. There may be some mild vocalization just in these seeking behaviors like that soft whining, you know, the persistent whining. Um, and then also breaking out of the crate. If people say like, well, once he gets, he's okay, he didn't hurt himself, but he's just such a Houdini in the crate. Why are they breaking out of the crate? It could be barrier frustration, but frankly, barrier, the term barrier frustration is they're frustrated about being behind a gate, a barrier, or in a crate. But it's oftentimes very much, that's another comorbidity or coinciding with separation anxiety, and the two are actually like running together. Last thing that you can also see is an anxiety behavior are those self-comforting behaviors. These are when they're chewing up and ingesting toys, bedding and cushions, they may be licking them, sucking on them, but also just chewing them up. The act of chewing is pacifying, or to unstuff is a way of, of kind of like, a, it's something to do, if you will. But it's, it's helping them to deescalate their anxiety, and that's why they're doing it. Uh, licking themselves. Of course, we all know about lick granulomas, and lick granulomas may not only be out of boredom, but they may actually be a part of anxiety. And the act of that licking and chronic licking is, is a, like a self-soothing behavior. Psychogenic alopecia in the cat. Uh, some dogs, I've had histories of where dogs are digging in the furniture. And this means when they may jump up on the couch and they're just dig, 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 dig like this, just very repetitively in the, the corner where the back of the couch may come to the arm of the couch or under pillows or tossing pillows off the bed. So, you know, asking about these things is important to help you know what level and what type of uh, separation anxiety they have. Now the acute separation anxiety, this is the one that is really a challenge to treat, but um, so most often the dog has already had some separation anxiety, but you didn't know about it. Wasn't that bad? You know, they didn't injure themselves for you as the veterinarian or the veterinary staff to be aware of this. Maybe you asked about separation anxiety. Again, the client may be assuming this is a doorway. It might be a little hard to tell in the picture, but frankly, this dog has ripped off all of the drywall, all of the trim, actually around that outlet. I don't know how that dog did not get electrocuted. And this is at four feet high. Anyway, at this point, this may be when the client is telling you about the problem. But prior to this, the dog may have been pacing and whining. Anyway, uh, there's a big, usually a big noise event and that is what now tips the dog over into a panic state. And that self-injury and property damage can be very severe. Uh, you will see these dogs, 
at the, say, just the close of the door of the home. That's the trigger that the dog knows you're really leaving or the sound of the garage door opening up as the car leaves. They really know their owner is gone now. You may see this rise to panic behaviors of where they are grabbing and ripping the door trim. They're digging and digging and digging in that flooring and they're starting to rip their nails. They're howling and they're whining and they're grabbing the bars of their crate. You may see them go from just a little bit of mild panting to that within a, like three seconds. That's how fast some of these dogs will rise to panic. For managing these dogs, they often require multiple medications, an appropriate daycare facility, and a very specific plan for this dog and this home for reducing the separation anxiety. Um, so for this, you definitely need a, a behaviorist with a veterinarian who has behavior expertise to work together with you. Now, this is my COVID considerations, okay? We're in COVID, so I'm giving a lot of education in general, but also, what about our time right now? So the factors that increase our risk of um, separation anxiety escalation at this time with all these stay-at-home orders. So it's the new routine. You know, as we say, change in routine increases risk for separation anxiety. So the new routine is everybody's home and this dog is getting three or four walks a day and the children may be at home and all this. So there really is very little time that people are leaving their dogs alone. So there's very little leaving and they're in this coming and going in a house has really been reduced. Um, we're, on, we're going on, I think, 10 weeks now in Illinois on our stay at home order, orders. This is, this is two and a half months. So this is now really a new established norm. There has been increased attention to the dog. The dogs are getting more walks and playing games, which increases the bonding. While that's really nice, in a sense though, we can be now over, like creating that overbonding situation. Uh, storm phobias, noise phobias, and housemate aggression can add to the separation anxiety. So as I said, right now is the time of year that we're in Illinois, and now we're in thunderstorm season. So this is gonna add to add anxiety if they have that noise and storm phobia to our dogs who already have some separation anxiety. Uh, if two dogs have been like uh, competing over food and toys and such, and there's been an increase in housemate aggression with this stay at home, and now we've got the family gonna be leaving and a change in routine, which is the housemate aggression anxiety is going to increase the severity of this dog's separation anxiety. If people got a new puppy at this time, but the puppy has not been socialized, they have not got the puppy used to the crate or any kind of what I call independence training, that I leave the room, I throw a treat to my dog as I leave the room, so my puppy gets accustomed or used to me leaving and not being with them or my new rescue dog. This can be a problem. This can add to separation anxiety. And your, that foster or new adoptee that your client has may have separation anxiety, but you don't realize it because you haven't you know, had to leave them. So what are we gonna do? <laughs> so first of all, let's talk about prevention. So we want to Follow, go back to that work routine. Follow back to what's your normal root work your, for your clients. What was their normal work routine before all this stay at home? We want to tell those clients to get up at the time that they normally would when they would normally have gone off to their job. Get dressed as if you are actually going to work. Um, especially if people are in uniform, yes, I think it's good for them to get in their uniform as they get up in the morning. You want to take that dog out and then you want to leave them at home alone for a little while. I mean, you want to tell your client, yes, you go off and take a walk somewhere. I, don't know. I know you can't go to <laughs> many places and things, but just, just get out of the house and leave the dog alone for maybe an hour or two. Now, when your client leaves, now this is the prevention level, okay? This is how we are prepping all dogs to be ready for leaving and to be independent. When you're gonna leave, I think it still is good to play some kind of calming music. And this is a link to my website at drsallyjfoot.com. Uh, it is called Butterscotch's Playlist. And this is the rhythmic heavy beat music that helps a lot of animals, dogs, dogs especially, to not escalate up to fear and panic uh, during thunderstorms. And I use this, this music list a lot for my separation anxiety cases as well. The music is based on heavy beat, you know, heavy rhythmic beat music, basically dance music, like, um, you know, just uh, triple swing, but it has to have male singers. It needs to be low in the bass tones and that, so you can download that there. 
The third thing to do is also play what I call a peekaboo game with your new puppy or your adult dog or new adoptee. And what that is, is where you are going to have use their meals for this. Take meal time and make it training time. Take a handful of food, you're gonna toss a little bit, say, in the living room. And as your dog goes over to eat it, that's when you walk away out of the living room and you just go in the other room for a couple, maybe five, 10 seconds. And then when you walk back in, you do not greet your dog. You ignore your dog because, and, and the point is they may come up to you for greeting, but we want when you walk back in that they're not paying attention to you. So it's almost like, hi, I'm here, I'm gone, I'm here. Okay, that idea with peekaboo. Uh, you always want to give some kind of reward, give the calming medication or any kind of therapeutic device when you are leaving, even now for short periods during COVID-19. You've got to make leaving fun. That is, that's the key element here with preventing separation anxiety is for all of our animals to have something fun, something good happening for them already in place when you're going to go. So I'm going to hope this runs well. This is what an example of what I call the peekaboo game. Okay, and so this is just demonstrating with the puppy. This comes from my puppy socialization program I just created for the housebound puppy. But the owner just left, she tossed food, Puppy's eating it, she comes back, she tosses, her puppy turns around, she closes the door, she's gonna toss some more, and she just kind of goes in and goes out, no big deal. And this is how her puppy learns to not be upset when she goes in the bathroom and closes the door, not be upset when she's in the bedroom by herself and he has to be loose in the living room. And that is how we prevent this puppy from being so hyper bonded from her to always have to be near. And that's what helps prevent him from becoming anxious about separation. Now, we need to be sure it is separation anxiety. So let's say you know, your client has just started work, it's June 1, and you know they're saying, oh my gosh, he's getting really upset. All these things were destroyed in the home. First, we have to be sure it is separation anxiety. Because there is something called separation fun. Oh, and that is a bored dog, yes, who knocks over the garbage and has it all over the room and also noise fears. Dog may have been resting fine all day until the garbage, can, garbage truck went by or a thunderstorm rolled in. And actually in the Calmer Canine study that was uh, SEC Health uh, did um, in collaboration with North Carolina State University, actually a lot of the dogs that were first going to go into this program when the clients videoed the dog's behavior it wasn't separation anxiety so you want to ask your clients to use a tablet or a cell phone something that's really easy to put it on and set up the area um set up the area where you're going to uh where you're going to be leaving the dog to be in view of this you know phone or camera and just go ahead and record a short video of the client leaving as if it was a regular day for work and then being gone for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, 20 minutes and come back. So the client is gonna start the filming as they prepare to leave. It's really important that you start, you see the video of what this dog looks like, just even those first steps of say, getting their coffee, getting their keys, picking up their laptop container, you know, bag or whatever, and then staying away, like I said, for five to 10 minutes and the return. You wanna see all of that. Now, if they don't show any anxieties in the first five minutes, we wanna let it run for 30 minutes. And the reason for that is some, those signs of anxiety may be very, very low, very, very brewing. And maybe some dogs do take, remember I said 20 minutes is usually that time for escalation up to the sci highest signs of anxiety. So you may have a dog who's really brewing, brewing, and you're just noticing a little lip licking, a little looking, and then at 20 minutes, you know, is when you now really will see those higher signs. So let it run for the 30 minutes if you don't see it in those first five. Well, let's say, yes, the dog is definitely showing anxiety signs with the person leaving, there's, you know, standing and all this. So you want, so you see those signs and now you want to identify the triggers to anxiety about separation. So you want to watch the video before, during, and after that separation. And, and really like have that poster, I showed you that earlier on in the talk, and, and your client can even do this too. You can assign it to the client so it doesn't take so much of your time, you know, for that first screening. But say, let's, you know, match what was happening when he started to lick his lips, his ears turned back, he had that sad look, the furrowed brow. What just happened? That's the trigger. Did the, did the owner actually walk through the door? Was it the click of the door shutting? Was it hearing that uh, garage door opening? 
that's the trigger. So then now you have your trigger list. And the first thing you want to do is eliminate all possible triggers. So maybe we're going to hide the laptop computer. You know, the laptop computer is going to go in a different bag, or maybe you keep the laptop at work and you work on a different computer at home. Maybe you will not wear your uniform. You'll get changed at work or, sorry, changed in the garage. Sometimes you have to get a little creative about this. Uh, or maybe we get the dog in a different area so that they don't see the bus or like the carpool pull up, because sometimes that's a trigger. So we get the dog in a different room, maybe playing some tossing, some uh, games to them, a ball or something, so they just don't see the trigger. Now we can't eliminate all of our triggers, so we may reduce the intensity, meaning we reduce the frequency or how close it is to them, how loud it is to them. Maybe you're gonna park the car outside and not in the garage so that we can eliminate the garage door sound, but the dog will still hear the car leaving in that case, you've, you've eliminated one out of two triggers. That will help. Uh, now, we, it's, what's really important is to give the appropriate medication, supplement, or treatment to create a calm mind so that the dog can take rewards when alone. We, so timing these things and using these things um, so that when the client leaves, they're already calm. That is then the key for helping to create an independent dog. Uh, so I talked about identifying the triggers. Now those early signs of anxiety count. And that's what's kind of, that's what's challenging. We never learned this stuff in veterinary school. We didn't, many of us did not learn this in veterinary technology school. So I'm going to just say, you know, be patient with yourself even if you're thinking like, well, I don't see it. Anyway, um, so, but it does count if your dog turns away as the client picks up their coffee mug and their keys. That dog is saying, I'm anxious about those two cues together because that means the coffee mug and the keys in hand are the trigger. So what can we eliminate? Okay, maybe we'll keep our keys in the purse. That one thing may actually help to decrease some of these uh, anxiety signs that are stacking up. Um, so it, it, does, it is hard work to eliminate these triggers, but I think the main thing is, you know, be creative, allow, you know, suggest your client to be creative and uh, you know, every little step that they take really does help with this trigger management. The home environment, we wanna manage that home environment. The property destructive dogs, um, you know, they, they really do need to go to an appropriate daycare that uses cages and runs for that downtime until they can be learned to be calm in confinement. And you need the appropriate daycare. That'd be a whole nother presentation here. Second thing is remove all evidence of the home damage because that's a reminder of, that digging in the past and kind of draws them to it. So I tell clients to just cover holes with maybe cardboard painted to match the wall. This is not the time to go into big major repair because the animal may still go back and destroy it. Um, maybe paper to cover the windows, things like this. Play the music and you know practice happy confinement before this COVID period right now is over with. Practice them you know, in the crate for four or five minutes, that sort of thing. We also want to screen for concurrent health problems. You know, uh, especially in the older dogs, we may have problems with urinary tract infection, arthritis, any kind of chronic body inflammation does change body chemistry that can result in increased anxiety or sometimes increased aggression. Ask about what is the exercise routine? Exactly what is this pet eating? Have them send you a picture of the food. Uh, what is the dog's day-to-day -day routine? Ask, is there anything else that gets this dog nervous? Because this is gonna be a part of the stack up for you know, those, other, those other anxiety problems add to this. And you want to avoid those triggers as much as possible. Enrichment, okay, we might make life fun. That's another way, another word for enrichment. My prescription for all dogs is they need a daily walk for one minute per pound of dog a day divided. So if I have a 60 pound Labrador, we need 60 minutes of walking a day, which actually four minutes, sorry, four 15 minute walks a day, I feel is best because it's breaking up the day, you're getting and walking in different areas, different places, that helps to keep life interesting and fun and they get their exercise outlet. Allow that dog to sniff. Sniffing is really important for them to, um, checking out the area, analyzing all those smells, change that route daily. It keeps their brain thinking. I would use food puzzles for all their meals. Skip the bowl. Again, we want to make life more fun, more interesting, more mentally engaging. 
You can also do some hide and seek games with their toys and practice their basic obedience training. So now I'll talk about medications and all the other good stuff here. All right, if we have a dog who's in high panic, they are ripping off the drywall, they are ripping off the trim, they have broken their teeth, the nails get bloody. They do need to hit a level, they need to go to a level of sedation of, as part of their therapy for actually actual departures when you're really leaving if they're not in daycare. They can't just learn to do this automatically. So the usual, the medications, and again, to talk about all the drugs with separation anxiety would take a whole nother lecture, but diazepam, clonidine, and trazodone combined with gabapentin, these are the kind of cocktails. Remember I said we're often on a two or three medication plan when we're doing medication. These are the drugs that are gonna be used at the time of actual leaving because they're gonna give you that sedation along with anxiety reduction. And I said combined with gabapentin because gabapentin is another medication that really helps to work with uh, decreased sensitization and noise and such. Oftentimes this cocktail is combined with a daily anxiety reduction plan, medication plan such as fluoxetine or clomipramine. Again, there's things, there's a loading time, it takes about a month to work, there may be side effects, things to consider. Now, supplement plans that may be used are the omega-3 fatty acid supplements with the probiotic. There's a lot of advancing information about that, along with uh, DNA milk calming protein B, B vitamin excuse me, supplement. Diets that can be used are Calm Diet and NeuroCare, especially for our older dogs. Now, start these things like supplements and diet, diet, excuse me, or the daily medication now before the client is actually going back to work if that dog is already showing the signs of separation anxiety because we need to get through this practice time and we also need to test out, you know, medication plans are not carved in stone. There's gonna be a bit of, you know, adjustment on the plan and we now is the time to do it while people are still at home and they can kind of mock up the leaving. Now, there's a new treatment for separation, separation anxiety in dogs, uh, the PEMF therapy device by Calmer Canine. Now, how this product works, it creates a pulse electrical wave in this halo, uh, in the form field, in the center of the halo. And the cells in the body um, after this, when, during this halo treatment, uh, increase their nitrous oxide. And nitrous oxide is the natural anti-inflammatory of the body. And we've been hearing a lot about nitrous oxide with COVID-19, haven't we? And this happens after a 15 minute exposure to the halo device. I'll have a picture of this in just a minute. Um, so nitrous oxide is a natural inflammation reducer. And so it helps to reduce inflammation in that is going on in the brain cells as well as in that. And this increases the serotonin and dopamine production in the brain. And through that increases how we're seeing, it's, it's uh, the theory is that that's how we're seeing the reduction in the anxiety signs. So this, this is a different wavelength. Some of you may be familiar with the ACC loop products that are for more muscular and more muscular um, inflammation, and there are other uh, devices out there. So the wavelength in this halo device is different. Uh, it's, I've been involved myself with my own dog on uh, using this device and, um, and some other uh, speaking and such. People have asked like, oh, can we just use you know, the, the device to use for like my dog's sore leg? And the answer is no. This is a different device, so we want to use you know, this device. It's a different wavelength. So here's a picture of the packaging, and that's a picture of my own dog, Bella, <laughs> getting her little calmer canine uh, treatment. So the device has a, um, a Velcro collar, you know, a little collar that go, and then the device Velcros to stick on there, so you don't have to hold it. Um, and then they just sit there and they can rest calmly for 15 minutes. I mean, that's a chair she likes to sit in. Yes, I do allow my dog on a chair. Uh, and so after she's had her morning walk and it's just kind of her typical quiet time, that's when she gets her 15 minute uh, treatment. So there was a study done um, through CC Animal Health in conjunction with the North Carolina State University's uh, Behavior Department. And that's where the referrals came for this uh, study. And uh, Dr. Margaret Gruen, who is the board certified veterinary behaviorist who heads the North Carolina State University's behavior department, presented this last year in uh, Washington, DC at the combined um, North American uh, College of Veterinary Behaviorists meeting with the International uh, College of Veterinary Behaviorists meeting. And 
So these notes are from her presentation. And so what she had said was part of the selection criteria was, you know, people with dogs who, had, who they, they were uh, referred either by the veterinarian or self-referred that had separation anxiety or signs of separation anxiety were referred to the um, department. So they, they took the dogs who may have been on one medication and they did not add any other medications. If the dog was not on a medication, they did not start any medication. Uh, there was already a behavior modification plan in use, and so they stuck with it. Dr. Groen did not comment if they altered or changed the behavior modification plan, and I don't believe that they did. Uh, the protocol was for the client to hold that halo device at the you know back of the head. You saw it in the photograph how it goes over actually the skull. So the, the client would hold it there for the 15 minutes twice a day. When the study was done, it was before they had the little, you know, Velcro neck wrap kind of vests so that you could do it hands-free. So it was held by the client twice a day for 15 minutes a day. And uh, they, the behaviors for the separation and anxiety were charted before therapy. And then at weekly intervals for a six-week protocol. And they, were, they also recorded the dogs once a week um, when the client left for each of these, you know, weeks uh, before and then throughout the treatment process at weekly intervals. And some of the notes from the improvement was that 50% of the dogs showed resolutions of signs by week six. That is tremendous. That is a lot. Separation anxiety, I think, is one of the most difficult behavior problems that we see in dogs to treat because it has so many different, usually other concurrent anxieties and, you know, and, and the panic that they hit. So, I feel that is really significant. 100% um, showed reduction of at least one of their anxiety signs. That's very helpful, of course. 56% of the cases who met their endpoint, meaning their goal of behavior for to be able to be resting and independent, you know, non-destructive, and the client left, reached that within one week. There were a significant number of dogs who were able to improve within one week's time. And currently, North Carolina State University is conducting a double-blind placebo-controlled study, which I think is going to be very interesting to see how that is, um, you know, what the results come from that. And Dr. Judy Corman, who works for CC Animal Health, had informed me that North Carolina State University, I believe, is still accepting, um, you know, cases or referrals for this study. I apologize, I do not have a contact information, but I do know if you go to the North Carolina State uh, College of Vet Med, you can find the behavior department and contact Dr. I would contact Dr. Margaret Gruen and maybe she can direct you if you might be someone who can refer somebody for the study. So this is an example of a case, uh, Elliot, before and after his uh, treatment with the calmer canine. So you can see the, that he's howling, that's what he's doing. He's howling, he's whining, he's wearing a thunder shirt. The scattered items in the room here are, they look like food puzzles, you know, the client has done the right things. He has food puzzles, he has, you know, treats and rewards. Uh, and now you see him tearing at the bed clothing. So this is some of that, that as I said, um, like unstuffing things, you know, wanting to chew, kind of either self-pacifying or frustration behaviors that they do. And of course, a big risk for ingestion. I had a Labrador that had nine yards of a bed skirt in her stomach from exactly this, when the client had to leave that dog. So this is still before. And now he's pacing around on the bed, looking up at the video camera, <laughs> barking, you know. Now this is a month later. And if you can see, Elliot is rolling around that food puzzle. He's playing with the food puzzle. He's more interested now in the food puzzle because his anxiety has lowered that he wants to explore and engage the food. He has appetite for the food. He's calm, he's resting. So these were some of the changes in Elliot. He was 80% improvement in his, or increase in his resting and sleeping behavior. He only spent 15% of his time whining and howling as compared to 71% prior to this. Um, I think these are gonna kind of automatically go. Okay. A second case, this was just another um, kind of testimonial, I guess, to the effectiveness as a veterinary technician used the calmer canine for her dog who had separation anxiety. And other, other co-anxieties that improved for this dog was he had been, the dog had been very anxious around the baby and now is far less so, as you can see in this photograph. And also the dog was also pacing and panting at the veterinary hospital. 
and now was also uh, far less so. And I'm, I'm hearing this in a lot of the cases as well that have used the calmer canine that without specifically, you know, having a behavior modification plan to treat these other co-anxieties, people are seeing a reduction in the other co-anxieties. And that, that's really nice. Uh, this is just a story about my dog, Bella. Um, you can read about this at my blog there, and I have the um, link there. But I, I, I attended the Clinical Animal Behavior Conference in Las Vegas, Nevada um, last November, and Dr. Corman presented about the calmer canine, and there was an offer for veterinarians to you know, be able to obtain one of the uh, calmer canines. And my dog you know, was 11 years old, and her reactivity was increasing despite you know, she had improved with training and I was maintaining the plan and uh, her supplement meds never really worked with her. But it was just getting worse. And at 11 years of age, I mean, there was a couple of things like my neighbor's red truck that would pull out and the golden doodle, I don't know why, the golden doodle across the street, she would see that dog. And you know, she, my dog is one of these dogs who go from basically sleeping, hear the dog and be running through the house up and down up the stairs within like two seconds to get to the window. And all I could think of is you are gonna break you know, rip, rupture your cruciate ligament because of this behavior. And you're older, I want you to go through this. Maybe she's having brain aging, maybe this device would work. Well, I used the calmer canine following the separation anxiety protocol. I charted her behaviors. You can read about it on the blog. And by week three, my dog was far less intense and frequent with her reactivity. And I maintained the benefit with maybe a once a day treatment two or three times a week, kind of like giving medication. So uh, this is my personal experience with the Calmer K9. So how do you use it? It sits on her head, as I said, for the 15-minute periods, daily sessions. The dogs really don't notice it. They can walk around. They can rest okay. And most dogs, you know, choo choose to use this when it's kind of a rest time for the dog, but they they don't mind it at all. Um, so you know, meds or this PEMF device. Well. I don't like to think of these things as an either or, but more of it's another tool in my tool belt. So I definitely uh, think of this as the primary device to use if I, we are worried about medication side effects. Yes, my dog was 11 years of age and I have medication resistant family. <laughs> I don't like to see her being put on a lot of drugs. And some of our side effects with our meds are things like lack of appetite. We may see disinhibition of aggression, uh, liver effects, and that's we want to avoid that. So this device is an option, you know, something that does not have those side effects. Uh, we can use this as an additional, we have the additional benefit of reducing other anxieties without the specific behavior modification. And we often do not see that so much with the, um, you know, when people are on a, just a medication plan. And you can use both. Again, go back to the study with NCSU. They included the dogs who are already on a medication and added this device. So if it's a severe case, you know, doing both medication and this device may be a best approach to really try to achieve improvement quickly. Um, I definitely recommend starting to use this device now before people go back to work if their pet already has some separation anxiety signs. You know, twice a day for 15 minutes is gonna be pretty easy for a lot of clients to get into doing at this time. They can continue it on when they go back to work, but because so many of these dogs show improvement even within one week, I really think that you know this device would be one to uh, put in your head first. Success is possible. As I said, it's one of the most difficult, complex, and multifaceted anxiety disorders. It takes time, small steps. Your desensitization and counter conditioning come in small steps. It requires changing the environment. Um, now, I think something that's really important for a lot of clients to understand is we're saying things like, ignore your dog, <laughs> throw food at them and leave them, leave them, is that it does not mean that there's gonna be a life without love for that dog, but it is gonna change how they love that dog. Uh, sitting on the floor for cuddles, and just remember, an independent dog is a happy dog, it really is. Uh, here's a list of my references, I'm trying to make sure that we have time for questions here. Uh, that's the reference for the study, um, and then, these are two other, uh, that other one is another reference, um, you know, using the, uh, sorry, a PEMF device in dogs. And this behavior textbook, I did put this down as reference. And that's, that's really because I know we have a lot of general practitioners on this uh, event and technicians. And this behavior textbook, the Handbook of Behavior Problems in Dog and Cat by Dr. Landsberg, 
Hunthausen and Ackerman, in my opinion, for me, this was always my easiest to go to, uh, the way it's written in the chapters with, you know, how, it, you know, how, the, how this uh, behavior classification presents, how you diagnose it, what would be the treatment, what is the medication, what is the pro and con in medication, you know, how it's written, which is really easy for me to refer to and, and that. So uh, as part of today's webinar, today's presentation, uh, there's some promotions here from uh, ACC Animal Health. And um, there's some context there for you to go ahead and find out more about this. Uh, and there's also, I guess, a coupon code there, CE is fun, <laughs> that you can use. Um, and then lastly, that's my contact information and my email. Please email me if you have questions, want to learn more. I do have a Facebook page, Foot and Friends. I have a newsletter. You can sign up for my newsletter at my website. Uh, I am also, also offering a seven hour race approved uh, CE day coming up Sunday, June 7th. Now this is me a live streaming of um, handling the aggressive and anxious dog and cat. And it'll include some live demonstration and some hands-on skills. We can make it very interactive, even for those of you who need to attend remotely. And, and that, of course, it's Bella sitting at the bank waiting to get her treat after a deposit. So. Thank you very much. And I think I will shift over to uh, Carol. Yes, I will uh, read you the questions in the chat room. Uh, I have a question about, oop, where did it go? Come back here. I just put myself on webcam, so. Okay. Uh, hmm. Okay, uh, can you speak to the possible connection between separation anxiety and dominance aggression? I have heard that some cases of separation anxiety meet, might be, as you said today, more like separation fun. The dog realizes there is nobody around to police his actions and that this might be a continuum with some forms of dominance aggression. Well, okay. Dominance aggression is actually an old term and we don't use the word dominance anymore. And if what you're referring to is more of a dog who is competing for space, competing for food or resources, that would be aggression. And aggression is the growling, staring, lunging, biting to have what the dog does not like to get out of their home or their way. Now, a dog may have aggression, an aggression towards another housemate dog because they're competing over food or towards the owner. The term now for that is called conflict aggression or owner-directed aggression and separation anxiety. And so therefore, there, because it is that, that form of aggression is still anxiety or fear-based, right? That, as I talked about, if we have many of these other anxiety problems, that will increase the likelihood of separation anxiety. We may also have then separation anxiety. But this is why it's so important to get, boy, thank goodness we live in this day and age where it's so easy for people to video what is happening in the moment of the behavior they're complaining about. Let's not even use a diagnos diagnostic term yet. Let's not call it dominance aggression. Let's not call it separation of anxiety or separation of fun or anything. If the client says, my dog always is like is jumping on me and parading around the house with my underwear and I think he's just dominant, just say, send me a video of what your dog is doing, okay? Then you go to, the, I have a second handout on my um, website called The Ladder of Aggression by Dr. Kendall Shepard. And that shows the anxiety signs then going up to aggression. And then you just match what is the dog doing? You know, what signs are the dog showing and about what? What is the dog trying to do? So if the dog is marching around with the underwear and jumping up and pawing at the owner. Is he whining when he's doing it? Well, then he's got some anxiety between and what's happening with the owner? If the owner is in their clothing getting ready to leave for work, that really isn't aggression to try to beat off the owner. It's, this com it's more of a, he's anxious about the owner leaving. He has just grabbed an object for self-soothing and it's separation anxiety. But it is kind of on, you know, it's, how should I say? There's this, that storm, right? That blending of different things. And we want, I think it's really important that we don't just pigeonhole terms and we, are we use these tools like body language charts, ladders of aggression, and just like in medicine, it's best for me to describe what I observe before I go to a diagnostic term. 
you know, and we, and we do this with each other. So I hope that answers your question that yes, we can see dogs who may have housemate aggression and owner directed aggression. And it also can increase the separation anxiety. But before we just generally talk about that, let's use video to really see these situations. So we have an accurate description and identify what's really going on there. Okay. Now, can the calmer canine device be used on puppies? We are seeing anxious pups become more anxious uh, due to COVID lack of socialization. Yes, I really, I am not in a position to answer that question. I don't know if it has, what the lowest age, youngest age of use has been, but I will say this. The primary problem we have with the puppies being so anxious is about lack of socialization, but they can socialize. You have to do it differently. I do have a housebound puppy socialization course on my website. I have some free YouTube videos on my YouTube channel, drsallyjfoot.com, that shows how to toss the rewards to the puppy staying six feet away. Now, what's really important is knowing those ages of socialization in the puppy. And if you as a veterinarian are seeing these anxious puppies, then uh, we need to get our puppies on products designed for the puppy to reduce anxiety paired with that daily reward for the noises and things that are just around them in the world and getting them out as we can safe, safely at the six foot distance. And we are able to do all of that. Um, so, and frankly, I, I, so products like the Adaptal Calming Pheromone Collar can be helpful. Uh, some of the supplements, uh, probiotics, make sure that puppy is up to date on deworming, keep them on the deworming schedule. Please see the proof that the, you know, that they have been dewormed for everything, rounds, hooks, whips, and tapes, and check for coccidia. Make sure the diet is appropriate. Uh, and that means one of the major companies, uh, you know, such as Hills, Royal Canaan, for a puppy diet, and some of these puppy diets have been fortified with DHA, because these puppies do not have enough of their own brain calming chemistry to help them to be less anxious. And so we need that plus that step-by-step -step socialization which is gonna be done just more creatively now. Thank you so much, Dr. Foote, for your presentation. Uh, for all of those of you who are on, you will receive a copy of the presentation. And certainly uh, you can be guided by ACC Animal Health to Dr. Foote if you have more questions and if you'd like to have more information about Calmer Canine. So thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. And keep your eye on our schedule. We have lots of things going on in the next three months. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Foote. Well, thank you very much. You all have a great day.